Hey, hey, welcome. It's February 19th, 2012. You're reviewing and listening to the Nerd Stalker Tech Week podcast. I believe it's number 22. I am hey. the only one that tracks it. Yes, you are. I'm Greg Gloria, <laughs> a.k.a. Social Greg on Twitter, and you are? I am Adolfo Ferranda, at Nerd Stalker on Twitter. How you doing, Greg? Oh, good, man. Long uh, social media week and uh, yeah. beer week. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to just go here. Oh, that's right. Beer I'm week. Suffering and that. social media week. You're right. <laughs> social beer. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, interesting combo, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. And you <laughs> do, you did the uh, China SF New Tech thing, right? That's right. We'll talk about that later. That was cool. Uh, I guess we'll just mention a little bit later and we'll talk about the next event coming up at Mighty. So. That's right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, Greg, let's uh, lead into this f- the first super hot story that everyone's talking about here. How Google tracked Safari users. What's going on? Wow. That story broke on February 16th by the Wall Street Journal by uh, Jennifer Valentino DeVries. Um, DeVries, DeVries. Uh, you know, they're they're saying that uh, Google and other advertising companies have been following iPhone and Apple users as they browse the web. Uh, you know, even though Apple's Safari web browser settings are set to block such tracking by default. Um, and so, you know, the technique, uh, in short, allows the companies to place a, a cookie, uh, you know, a small text file uh, to be stored on the user's computer to track their activities on either that mobile device that Safari is using or on the desktop device. Um, it, it was it was really kind of piggybacked on some research or discovery uncovered by a Stanford researcher, Jonathan uh, Mayer, uh, not the singer, <laughs> okay, <laughs> the researcher, Jonathan Mayer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's a graduate student uh, in law and computer science, which is really kind of an interesting combo at Stanford. Um, he works in the security lab, which is uh, in the Center for Internet and Security. So they track privacy issues essentially um and discuss them and as it comes to internet and law right so it's an interesting combination Hmm. um so you know the the google response back to that well you know we didn't really realize some of this and you know we're not you know we're not totally um you know guilty of this you know everyone does this in fact if you go to well on our back stories i'll post a rebuttal uh of jonathan um mayer to the uh, statements by Google, it was really it's an interesting read because it, it, it talks about, well, you know, if Facebook kind of does that, and that's what Google's assertion was in, mm-hmm. in some of their um, uh, that, you know, Facebook's like button is similar. Interesting. Um, but, you know, he points out that there's some uh, definite dissimilarities um, and you guys should check that out so what, what's your something that you're thinking on this i think you know this is an interesting trend that's starting to happen here you know we have last week's story that we discussed path you know and it seems mm. like suddenly mm. you know mm. not just the um the features of all these you know uh applications or products or whatever you want to call them but uh now we're getting beyond the cool factor and now we're getting into sort of the concern of our own sort of usage and our in our you know our own privacy and things like that uh, with mm. these services, um, and how we're being tracked. I know, you know, when being Android owners, uh, when we have to accept uh, uh, applications, you know, to install them, you see a litany of stuff, you know, for yourself to to uh, accept. Um, let's say right. Pandora, for instance, you know, going back to this contact example, why do they need to read all my contacts when I'm just installing a music application, right? And And all these things. And we just accept them, you know, just mm. just the way it is uh right, it's interesting right. now though with with uh you know google plus and, and this and that that uh that that we're noticing these things too that that uh, suddenly we're you know passively being followed or or whatever right I, i'm just wondering if it's there's a lot of paranoia out there I, i'm wondering if it's to be expected or not you know like i said it's it's more for me an issue of I, I I don't know this story as deeply as you do, but for me it's it's more of a what are they doing with my data as opposed to uh, uh, are they gathering it or whatever. But yeah, I, I think that the you know some of it the debate is valid as I'm going to say. You know I don't know if if everything in the backstories of everything is is really clearly understood at this point, but you know the researcher. You know, they're they're concerned about you know some some of these type of issues of of opting in people versus just doing it without opt in, right? Mm. I, I think if you go to that level and forget about 
you know, it's Google or Facebook, or whoever. I think their assertion is is that should they at any level uh, allow opt-in, right? Um, and, and at least letting the user know that they're knowingly letting this happen. And right. I think that's kind of the bait that they're trying to say. I I think they're turning this into more much of a Google evil empire versus the world thing yeah, in the media. Sure, sure. And I, I'm not really buying that one too much, but mm. you know, going back to the, the bare bones of the opt in thing like they have an email, right? right. So hmm. So anyway, cool. I, I thought that was it's a hot story. I mean, yeah. it's going to continue on for the next few days, yeah. next few weeks, maybe. Yeah. But um, anyway, l- let's lead you into another hot story because mm. we're 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 Apple lovers, aren't we? <laughs> uh, what's uh, what's this rumor about iPad three that you're seeing out there? Yeah. So this one comes from uh, Zach Epstein uh, of Boy Genius Report. Thanks for the story. Uh, you know, usually I don't talk about rumors, uh, especially with yeah. uh, devices, uh, especially Apple devices. But this one, for some reason, seems to carry more weight for me. It just feels, it just feels right. So, in terms of what, of what they're sharing, uh, so that's that's sort of why I'm bringing it up. I typically have policy not to do this, but uh, so this purported uh, images of uh, Apple's next generation iPad have been published by a Chinese language uh, site called Apple Daily ahead of the new tablet's oh, yeah. official announcement. Uh, which is supposedly supposed to be in March. The the slate had uh, leaked only in bits and pieces until now. However, alleged photos mm-hmm. of an assembled iPad 3 show a device that is uh, very much in line with earlier reports uh, of rumors. And the case is similar to the one found on the iPad 2, though it has apparently been uh, redesigned with a more gradual taper leading from the back to the edges. Uh, Apple Daily also states that the iPad 3 feature, a 9.7-inch Retina display, this is sort of another indicator of why I feel this is sort of truish, because this is kind of what I've been hearing and sort of sensing, is that they're yeah, probably going to release yeah, something like yeah. an 8, an 8-inch eight device or something like that. Uh, anyways, which was confirmed last week with an 8-megapixel camera, as has been rumored previously. Apple is reportedly planning to unveil the iPad 3 at a press conference in early March, and the tablet is also expected to feature a quad-core Apple A6 processor and embedded 4G LTE connectivity. Um, Nice. So all about these things and and such that it's getting really close to the release date, and it seems like Apple's starting to sort of talk more now, and I I think they're having a bit more uh, difficulty keeping secrets and things like that, especially with all these... uh, manufacturers that they have to use in other countries and stuff like that um mm, this is mm, this is feeling this is feeling right and all the, all these specs sort of s- uh, tend to feel right too no I, I in fact i don't know if you caught the mac rumors one which you know I, I, like like you i don't think i like to talk about this in in this podcast that often uh, mm-hmm. or at all but I, I agree with you i think it feels right and i think you know the the it just in fact you think if Apple is is really good, as we talked about in many podcasts, about um, getting a long runway and and, and, and and stirring up the anticipation. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and yeah. and these things just add to that. So I think Apple's just you know, st- you know, staying back and saying, "Wow, this is great." You know, people are getting excited. You know, yeah, yeah. And uh, Mac, but anyway, Mac Rumors had a um, a picture. If you guys go to that, you mm-hmm. can see it on MacRumors.com. Uh, um, of of two displays next to each other, the iPad 2 display and the iPad X or 3, whatever you want, yeah, you want to call yeah. it, I'm not sure. Right. It's actually double the resolution. Right. Um, so it's it's going to be a really cool display, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Really cool display. It, so. what, and also a particular interest, oddly enough, you know, everyone was making fun of like people holding up an iPad to the side of their head or or trying to take pictures, but. I mean, this thing's going to have an 8-megapixel camera, allegedly, right? And uh, I have to admit, I see tourists all the time in San Francisco holding up their iPads and taking pictures. And it's... Um, yes, yes. And I've mentioned this before, you know, that, that how crazy that is. Um, because it's such a piece of junk camera that's on the iPad right now. Uh, right, and, right. And it, right. Makes, it makes perfect sense, I think, for them to do that. I could see that you know, all the jokes have been sort of silenced now because people are actually holding iPads to the side of their head or no, are holding up, and t- yeah. hold, holding no, up this no, thing and taking pictures. No. Well, well, it was the same thing for the um, the uh, iPhone three, right? Remember, it had a pretty crap camera on it. Yeah, too, yeah, that's right, right that's and, right. You know, and, and when they went to the iPad four, then you know, I mean, all the all the um, 
the now producers yeah, of yeah, m- yeah. movies are coming out now, right? Yeah. So it was such a big leap, right? And, yeah. and it's Huge. the same thing here, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. Well, cool. Oh, man. Next story. Uh, hey, Greg, what is this uh, U.S. startup density and valuation? Silicon Valley still number one. That sounds awfully complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, well, it's supposed <laughs> to be. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. It was just I, – I think last week we talked a little bit about the um, – the rise or the decline in 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 um, unemployment in here in the Silicon Valley area, right? So I thought this was a good follow up to that. That um, someone who wrote the article, uh, thank you. Um, you know, it was posted past me by on Twitter by my follower supporter Sheridan Tatsuno of uh, Dreamscape Global, uh, which pointed to an article by John Cook of Geekware, and and what he was really saying, he, he I guess he's in the Seattle area. He's talking about the Seattle area and how it's not keeping up with the rest of the country. That's really was where the article was, and uh, this group called you know Fee Fighters, you know they created some data that kind of looked at um, startups in various cities around the country. And the interesting thing to note, uh, startup density of Silicon Valley um, in terms of number of startups per 100,000 people. Um, we have about 175 uh, K startups. I mean, wow. it, was, it was just an incredible 175 per 100,000 people. I mean, it, that's wow. incredible. I, that that is just incredible. I believe it. And then Boston, in Boston, that you know, 90, you know, Atlanta's at 60 K. But it just, mm. it's just incredible, right? Mm. But the the article went on to go really about valuation and how. Um, the uh, you know the people who are the venture capitalists, the angels who are investing in these things are evaluating um, these startups, and obviously Silicon Valley is number one. Um, it's not a necessary indicator of success, but at least you know if a lot of people are on board with a lot of these guys, you know that they're pumping money in, and and the chances of success are a little bit greater than a bootstrap startup, right? Mm, yeah. And then Seattle's number two, and then New York is really catching up with Seattle, number three, but. Uh, I think one of the takeaways from the the takeaways from the article I saw was that you know um, you have choices now. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you think about it, isn't just the Silicon Valley; it's choices around the country, and it depends on whether you feel that you need to be in Silicon Valley here sure. and rub elbows with everyone or not, or around um, the world, but yeah. or, or around the world, right? And I think that um, you know. The guy goes to debate about that type of reasoning is that do you really need to go to the Silicon Valley? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people come here from all around the world right now, right? I yeah, mean, they do. For, to all these co-working spaces and everything else. And I think that the ecosystem here in the Silicon Valley is quite unique, so I think that's why they come, right? Yeah. So, what do you- That's interesting, yeah. Um, uh, it will particular interest there is that uh, New York was number three. I thought I was uh, uh, for sure number two. They've had, I know Bloomberg has made a big effort to try to promote uh, this whole tech tech uh, ecosystem mm. there. Uh, and, right. uh, you know, they've right. always had a really good tech ecosystem, but I thought they would be like number two right. or something like that at this point. So that's that's very yeah. interesting that Seattle's the, the number two. Yeah. It, like I said, I thought it was a good follow-up or article to yeah. the unemployment trend that's happening. Which but this just goes to show entrepreneurship is good. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. We like nerds. Yeah. So, uh, Adolfo, what's this thing about uh, retailers shutting down their Facebook storefronts on Twitter I saw from you this week? Yeah, not good news for uh, Facebook stores. So this comes from Bloomberg, uh, from Ashley Lutz. Uh, Last April, GameStop. GameStop Corporation opened a store on Facebook to generate sales among the 3.5 million plus customers they've de- that declare themselves fans of the video game retailer on Facebook. Uh, six months later, the store quietly shuttered. Uh, GameStop has company over the past year. Gap, J.C. Penney's, and Nordstrom's all open and closed stores on Facebook social ne- social networking site. Uh, the store's quick failure shows that the social network doesn't drive commerce and cast out on its value for a retailer, says Sucharita Mulpuru, an analyst at Forrester. He says it was like trying to sell stuff to people while they were hanging out with their friends at a bar. Uh, a year ago, <laughs> investors hailed so-called F-commerce as the next big thing, speculating that the company had potential to threaten Amazon and PayPal. Facebook is the most visited website in the world. Some people thought that persuading visitors to shop would be easy, Mulpura said. Customers had no incentive to shop at GameStop. 
uh, GameStop's Facebook store rather than the company's regular website because purchasing online is already convenient, said Ashley Sheets, who is the Grapevine Texas-based company's vice president of marketing and strategy. Uh, we just didn't get the return on investment we needed from Facebook uh, market from Facebook from the Facebook market, so we shut it down pretty quickly. She said in a telephone interview, "For us, it's been a way we communicate with customers on deals, not a place to sell." Gap, which has 5.6 million Facebook fans for its namesake or from its namesake, Banana Republic and Old Navy pages opened and dis- discontinued a storefront last year, said Liz Noonan, a company spokeswoman. The San Francisco-based company also discovered customers preferred shopping on its own sites. She said, cracks in the model showed really quickly, Wade Gerton, CEO of social media developer 8th Bridge, said in a telephone interview, clients have taken a different approach, shutting, shutting stores or scaling back their offerings. It was basically just another place to shop for all the stuff they are was already available on the retailer website, as Curtin said. So he gives so-called F-commerce an F. <laughs> well, F means a lot of things, right, my friend? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Greg, let me ask, have you ever bought anything mm-hmm. off of Facebook or from a Facebook store? You know, I've looked at the pages. Uh, Procter & Gamble, I looked at their page. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was interesting, but would I buy something through them? I, I don't think so. I, I th- well, I just, oh. I never have. I mean, yeah, I didn't yeah. even, I've never seen an opportunity to buy anything on Facebook, and I, I don't oh, okay. know that I would anyways, but. I, I, I study a lot of those Facebook pages just from a client standpoint mm. when we do a lot of PR and marketing, and I, I, personally, I've always felt that Facebook is was a good channel to channel things into mm. another area. Yeah. So, like, I feel that rewarding people who follow you might be a good way to get them into your store or into the actual normal e-commerce mm. path, but I never felt uh, Facebook was a great way to do that. I, I love that thing you said earlier. It's like, you know, be a bar with your friends and trying to sell them on something. <laughs> something like, yeah. oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> right. Another thing they were sort of comparing it to is like Facebook, sort of the mall where you hang out at, not necessarily the store that you go into mm, and buy something. Analogy. Right. Um, good analogy. But yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, when you try to, it seems like uh, the, their priorities haven't, really seem to have, like Facebook's priorities doesn't really seem to have been this storefront thing at all. I mean, it seems like timeline and, and that sort of the social experience has been sort of its emphasis and its priority. So uh, trying to be all things to all people it never seems to work out well. And well, especially when you're now, going against Amazon, my God. Now, now, do you share, let me ask you another question. Do you share advice on things if someone asks you on Facebook? Like, you know, do you know of a, you know, you'll see sometimes once in a while from one of your friends saying, do you know a good app that does this? Or do you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, um, rarely, rarely. I know I've shared, you know, recently I bought, I bought a webcam and I emailed you the information about the webcam. Oh, I could have, I was tempted right, right. To, to post it on, on Facebook just to you, but okay. I don't know that I want okay. a bunch of other people knowing, you know, what I bought um, for, for me and you, yeah. that's fine too. And I think yeah. that also right. shows the challenge of why a lot of these so- social shopping apps and solutions haven't really taken off also. Mm, I've seen endless pitches for these type of things and, and I have yet to see a really successful social shopping um you know, type of thing. I think maybe Pinterest would be the only thing, and that's not really an e-commerce right. site per se. But we'll talk about that later. <laughs> oh, cool! Yeah, exactly. No, I, I think uh, spot on. I, I, I think they just, you know, Facebook needs another another way of getting some more money with their m- billions of dollars that they're going to get at their IPO. <laughs> yeah. So, Greg. All right. Next story, yes. man. What is this? EMI helps developers navigate building apps for music industry. Well, you That's and I are music aficionados, and mm-hmm. you know we we always talk about uh, the music industry and how it's old and it's you know it's just not with the times. Well, I thought this was a good article to bring up. Um, it was uh, it caught my eye from one of the tweeters, uh, uh, not that necessarily I followed, but I just found it. Uh, Joel Corpy from Austin, Texas. Thank you, Joel. A uh, story from Programmable Web by Ken Lane. Uh, it, it says that the music industry is a very attractive area for developers and uh, that build web and mobile apps because of the wild appeal of music of all ages, right? So that's why you see a lot of these uh, Spotify, I mean, uh, uh, 
these apps coming up, right, to listen and, and share music socially, right? Mm -hmm. Well, music industry juggernaut EMI, which announced will be bought by Vivendi Universal this month, right, uh, in another consolidation of the music industry, um, and Echo Nest, uh, uh, which, you know, you don't know these guys, but they're behind platforms like iHeartRadio, uh, Nokia's Music's Mix Radio, uh, even wow. Spotify, actually. Wow. And no one knows this, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're the engine behind this. Right, they have sure. the API and everything behind it that sure. that allows people this, this access. Typical of plumbing. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I think that you know this, the two main objectives of this push towards developers from EMI and 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 uh, EchoNest is really the first is to streamline the horrific horrific uh, music licensing process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you and I had talked about this in a couple podcasts ago about how difficult it is. Um, and, and the, you know, secondly, um, making it easier for coders and developers to create applications accessing a, a music industry's content, right? Like EMI, right? Which mm -hmm. has a big catalog. Um, and so I think trying to open up its catalog is promising, but I, the debate out there is it's a little disappointing because I think um, they're insisting on approve, approval process through EMI, meaning that it's almost kind of like Apple where, mm -hmm. you know, the guy will develop um, the API or the app through their API, but they need the final approval to say, yeah, this is good. Go ahead and do it. Oh, um, wow. So it's not clear how, you know, how ideas – are going to be published, whether it's only EMI thinking it's a good idea or it's really good for the industry. It's yet to be determined or debated. Um, you know, UK uh, writer from Wired, uh, Duncan Gear, said that um, in November when they launched the service, actually, uh, instead of making as much content as possible available as widely as possible, you could accuse EMI uh, of just trying to crowdsource a set of nifty apps for their artists. Mm, <laughs> I mm. thought that was interesting, but mm -hmm. I, I thought this was kind of a good good movement towards maybe a more neutral center for the So uh, anyways, let's industry. go to the next one. Uh, yeah, man. Which is a hot topic of these days, right? Totally. Pinterest, right? Ah. Uh, l l let's talk about that. They're not playing dumb about making money. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> depending on how you say it, Pinterest or Pinterest, I don't know. I say Pinterest. Uh, yeah, so thanks to TechCrunch's uh, reporters, uh, Alexis, Alexis Sosis and Ingrid London. Uh, so there are stories about how it's secretly, how Pinterest is secretly monetizing using a service called Skimlinks in order to drive affiliate revenue from purchases that originated on Pinterest. So Skimlinks is one of those things like you mentioned in the previous uh uh, thing that you just talked about, the EMI story, uh, right. one of those plumbing type of things, right, that everyone seems to use, but no one seems to know about uh, in terms of affiliate uh, making mm -hmm. money, revenue, affiliate revenue type of stuff. Sure. So some reporters implied that Pinterest has funded itself through affiliate revenue for two years and then ditched the service after it received serious VC, venture capital, uh, provoking an interesting counterpoint article in the Wall Street Journal about Pinterest's right of passage, huge traffic, no revenue. The Atlantic's Alexis Madrigal, admittedly not knowing the company's financial, takes issues with the Wall Street Journal and postulates that Pinterest could rake in $45 million in annual revenue using affiliate links with its current traffic. So Madrigal's logic is, is this. Number one, we know Pinterest is driving truly massive traffic to retail sites by some accounts more than YouTube, LinkedIn, and Google Plus combined. It is, after all, a platform that it, that's perfect for shopping. Number two, we know Pinterest and Skim Links. Uh, I mean, we know Pinterest used Skim Links to add affiliate links. And number three, mm -hmm. affiliate links generate revenue. Commissions on sales for affiliate links vary widely, but they average around five percent. After Skim Links cut, yeah. that'd be about three point seven five percent, give or take. Uh, sometimes even lower if it's negotiated with volume type of thing. Uh, so Pinterest has 10 billion users. Let's say that the average across all of them is that they buy items valued at 10 bucks in a month okay. uh, through affiliate links on Pinterest. That's $100 million of sales for which Pinterest would get credit. That's $3.75 million in monthly revenue or $45 Whoa. million of annual revenue. 
This runs counter to what TechCrunch heard uh, about the actual amount of revenue brought in to Pinterest by Skimlinks, which was modest for an internet company between uh, ten to twenty thousand dollars a year, according to one <laughs> source. So this is a huge variation here. Using Madrigal's formula, this would represent somewhere between three hundred thousand to six hundred fifteen thousand dollars in transactions coming through the service. The truth right. is that the use of skim links on Pinterest was more a question of analytics it provided than any serious effort at monetization. Uh, word on the street is that everyone in the Valley passed on Pinterest when it was raising initial capital, uh, something okay. that wouldn't have happened uh, if it had a, indeed already discovered a viable business model. Uh, the story of Pinterest right now is exactly what it looks like. It's really, it really is a, a hot startup gets venture funding, uses it to scale. Not startup hides the fact that it's already profitable. And with its kind of scale and coffer, it could be losing a million dollars a month and still be a good bet. Wow. 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 Well, I think the difficulty is in affiliate sales is hmm. really establishing those affiliate contracts, right? Think uh -huh. about how many vendors are out there. That, right. You know, and this startup, I'm sure, isn't staffed up to do all this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it makes a lot of sense, I think, when you run math like, like they simply did. Yeah. But yeah. I know from just running contracts at our company and, mm -hmm. and making um, partnership agreements, mm -hmm. those aren't easy, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, some of them, some big companies like Amazon or like not Amazon, but other companies do make it easy, you know, yeah. where you just click a button. But a lot of them, you have to contact the people. You have to have an email conversation. You got to yeah. look at the contract. You got to have your lawyer look at the contract. Have their lawyer, if you're doing something different, right. their lawyer look at the contract. So it, 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 it's a great idea, and I think they probably could capitalize it, but they need probably a lot more resources. Yeah. So I guess the question is still out. Are they making money? Are they doing it by affiliate sources? Or are they somehow becoming one of these sort of like just marketing information sources, databases, right? And showing our interests, you know, based on demographics yeah. and then selling it to right. advertisers or whatever. Or a combination of both. Who knows? Probably so. Um, plus, they're sitting on a pile of probably VC money also. So we shall yeah. see. Yeah. There's a lot of people signing up. And the question is, are they going to be just another... Google Plus, which gets another a lot of momentum, or yeah. they're gonna Good point. and and die off eventually, yeah. or are they gonna be a, a serious player in the conversation amongst the other big players like Twitter and Facebook? Mm -hmm. You know, so. Mm -hmm. That's good yeah, advice. We'll advice can transition yeah. to a tip. And being tip time, that's this tip, tip time. time. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> See what I, I did there? Tip time. <laughs> yeah, yeah was, you, you pretty, do that a lot better than I do. My pretty friend. professional so, there. Tip time. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, Greg, this, what's your tip? This is the weekly tip from our media supporter, Drippler. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Drippler <laughs> and Matan. Uh, so th this week I thought, okay, well, let's, let's search and see what, what, what they have. And this tweet kind of came out of Dr Drippler from one of my um, news sources there. Um, there's 40-plus tips and tricks to get the most out of your Android, which I always felt, you know, we're only touching the surface with our phones, right? We use it every day, and you don't want to fall into that trap like that guy at the op or <laughs> the guy at the symphony at New York Times in New York, right? So, mm. so I think that um, these tips that they saw were really kind of cool tips. You may know a lot of them already, but you know, I bet you don't know all of them. It's 40 plus. Um, so it goes oh. anywhere from you know searching your text messages, Kindle books, and tweets all at once to the. Uh, Cyanogen Mod 7 that lets you disable two-thirds of your LEDs to save your battery power, oh, which cool. is, a, is a problem, right, in, in, in a lot of uh, our Android devices, right? So, so I think that was, that's a good tip. Thank you, Drippler, and I'd like to share that with you. I'll put that on the backstories as well as we'll put that on the website. So, right on. Great hey, tip. And, 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 uh, and your uh, tip of the week, my friend. Yes, my tip is uh, comes from Lifehacker yet again. Thanks to Adam Dacus for this. It's uh, called deck.js. So what you can do, okay. it's uh, effectively a PowerPoint replacement. If you know a little bit of HTML, JavaScript, you're sort of good to go. So creating a presentation with deck.js is very simple. Mm -hmm. Although it may seem daunting at first if you don't know a ton of 
HTML or CSS, there's plenty you can do. Here are the basic steps. Number one, you write a simple HTML document to hold the content and format of your slides. Number two, you choose a theme yeah. to decide, I mean, to adjust the way your slides look. And then number three, you just add the extensions to your deck to enhance its functionality. Uh, obviously, if you want to do more, you can write a theme yourself using HTML and CSS. When you're done, yes. you'll have a presentation that you can post online for view for others to view. Alternatively, you can keep it on a flash drive and run it on any computer with a modern web browser. It makes your presentations very portable, so you can view them uh, from anywhere and know that you have them in a format that doesn't require any special software, which is awesome. Um, so another great mention of this, a similar story I saw in the comments of this story is uh, uh, Eric Myers has a solution called S5, which uh, there's no need to edit the JavaScript at all. And it's a little more uh, traditional, sort of professional looking in a different kind of way. Um, but it's it's very cool and worth a look. So look at uh, deck.js as, as an option and S5. You can Google those things and I'll add the links also here on the show and in the show. Wow, notes. that is cool. Thank you for that tip, man. That, yeah, man. That, I, we, we don't need PowerPoint anymore. I, I know. That would be great. <laughs> so what's going on, Greg? What's coming up? Well, I, I think um, we're on the uh, crescendo side of Social Media Week here in San Francisco. The, I, it was really mm -hmm. great if it, everyone didn't go. And we were just closing up the uh, Chinese tech uh, event uh, at uh, SF New Tech last week, and that mm -hmm. was great as well. Yeah. We have another one coming up on uh, February 22nd. Uh, SF New Tech has the uh, event in the cloud. In the cloud. cloud. From, yes, in the cloud. Uh, I think I felt like that after Beer Week, actually. But um, it, cloud apps from project management tools to mobile phone services, you'll see there. And you'll have six hot startups uh, that are uh, promoting those services. Mm -hmm. So uh, be there on February 22nd. It's usually a Wednesday night, which it is. Uh, 5.30, doors open. 7.30, the pitch starts. And I'll be on the pre-show as usual on Ustream at 7 o'clock. So you know, feel free to interact with me, and I'll maybe have some interviews uh, pre and post uh, awesome. of the event. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, I have one more event I want to pitch. Okay, great. Uh, we just, uh, my company, Vtrax, uh, we just the, uh, started a new uh, entrepreneuring event for business uh, people uh, from Japan. So it'll be oh, in Japanese, but but we're going to give, it's called Business Dojo, and we'll be giving um, seminars and tips to budding entrepreneurs in any industry. It doesn't have to be web tech. It could be, you know, whatever they're starting up, but it'll be in Japanese to help them through processes here in the United States to get acclimated and to successfully start off their business. So that'll be at Citizen Space Great. on February 28th. I'll be streaming that live as well. And uh, hope you guys can make it out there. Citizen Space is a great co-working space. So you'll get to also see how uh, a, a uh, funky co-working space uh, looks and, and operates. So you can talk to a lot of the people there. So Awesome. I got a, cool. something I got to pitch too, I just remembered. Uh, oh, cool. We are working right. on here, uh, Greg and myself, we've uh, volunteered to, to help out with this event. It's called Taste of Patrol. You can check them out at tasteofpatrol.com. Unfortunately, I don't know the exact date, but it is in May. Um, so check it out, tasteofpatrol.com. I'll add the uh, information in the show notes and uh, here, probably down below here, the date. Um, and it's going to be a really cool event. What it is, it's a, sort of a nonprofit type of thing. It's just a fundraising event for a public school that is really hurting here in San Francisco and could use uh, all the help that, that they can get. So it's tastepatrol.com. There's amazing food and restaurants and uh, wine type of things and tastings and auction type of thing where you can go to. And this can be really cool. I think a lot of different interesting people are going to participate. And uh, if you can help, please do. Uh, you can contact me. And uh, speaking of uh, of uh, participating, how about participating in uh, adding a story for Nerd Stalker, huh? So, hey, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, how can they do yes, that, Greg? Yes. Well, you could use the hashtag NRDSTK, um, and we'll, we monitor that link on uh, all our social media channels, and we, we appreciate people who do use that or retweet us on that because we, we see that and we see what the popularity of any article that we think is popular is, is going to be. Or you could catch us uh, and you catch us on YouTube. And um, just look at Nerd Soccer TV uh, for that channel. And uh, we appreciate uh, any comments there as well, as well as the looks. It looks like our looks are coming up now. And uh, I'm pretty happy about that. Or you can just catch us on our website every week when we post this. Uh, Adolfo does a great job of editing and putting up our audio podcast as well as our video uh, Vlogcast, I guess I'll use a modern term nah. these days. I don't know. I'll or I just made vlog, that up. Vlog, vlog, vlogcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so we appreciate all the comments and uh, feedback coming back. And uh, Adolfo and I are uh, enjoy your support. We get a lot of interesting tweets sometimes. Yeah, and one one other thing I want to mention is please check us out at iTunes too. You can subscribe to our audio and video um, podcast vlog there if you'd like and also if you're on itunes please uh feel free to give us a rating that'll help us in in uh you know give us a little more uh search juice in itunes so we'd really appreciate that so greg if we uh want to get a hold of you how do we do that you could uh, catch me on twitter at social greg or you can catch me on at gmail just send me an email at social greg sf at gmail.com and you for adolfo you can catch me at adolfo at uh, nerdstalker.com or you can catch me on twitter here at, at nerdstalker so i uh, appreciate everyone joining us uh, this week and thanks for listening or watching okay have a great week out there and be careful out there <laughs>